Happy to have Oliver Klein here from 475. Oliver's a registered architect, he's a lead AP, certified passive house consultant, and he's going to speak about his company, 475, High Performance Building Supply. And their mission is, is to make our buildings more durable, uh, resilient, ecological, energy efficient. Got that right off their website. All of which enables them to be dramatically reduce our energy demands and consequently our impact on climate. And still, to do that without, like I'm always chasing, occupant health and safety. We've got to take care of those things. So with that, please welcome Oliver. I am a registered architect, and I did get an MR from the Boston Architectural Center uh, kind of later in my career, about 10 years ago. Uh, before that, I, have, I got an engineering degree from Dartmouth College at Player School of Engineering. And my specialty there was building science, uh, sorry, not building science, but material science, which uh, does uh, have some overlaps with building science and got me to where I am today, working at a firm uh, that is founded by architects and helping the architectural and the building professions to build better. Um, but uh, we are, the, the, our, our company is a little different um, typical building supply houses out there, uh, and that again, you know, we're founded by architects, and uh, there's a lot of knowledge to go with the products that we provide, and there's a lot of new knowledge uh, that requires education, and that's one of the reasons I'm here today is to uh, hopefully help educate you and some of these uh, new uh, building blocks of, of high performance and a specialty. Especially uh, regarding uh, <coughs> passive house construction. So, uh, making this performance, this, this uh, presentation today, really as focused as possible on passive house. Uh, how many of you uh, are all familiar with passive house? Everybody here? Is that something you talk about? Well, those of you who aren't as familiar will hopefully learn uh, more about it. Uh, so about our company first, uh, and I wanted to just show a few slides about the kinds of products we sell. I also have a little show and tell here on the side if you're interested in taking a look after the presentation. Uh, so you can see we're, uh, we have a, a website. Uh, this is our storefront. We're an e-commerce built uh, business, and every, everybody orders uh, online. And we can ship anywhere in North America. We have both a, a, a U.S. and a Canadian uh, business. Uh, so we've partnered with a number of companies, all based in Europe. Uh, Proclima is one of the preeminent building science-oriented companies developing high-performance materials uh, in, in Europe. And they do business around the world. And we are happy to be the exclusive distributors for this company and others uh, that you'll see here, uh, here in North America. And so Proclima has developed a very high performance uh, airtight, air tightness and vapor control solutions for the exterior of assemblies, a complete systematic approach. Really, they, they've left nothing out. So you see membranes, tapes, gaskets, everything that you need to make your building as airtight as possible and protect it from moisture on the exterior. And they've also developed similar components for the interior, both air sealing and vapor control. In Europe, to give you a little background, the primary goal is to make the interior uh, airtight. And they like to call the exterior airtight layer the wind-tight layer. And it's really considered often a secondary layer. But you can make them both <coughs> as airtight as you want. But we like to emphasize the European approach at our company, since all our products are from Europe. And we're bringing some of these ideas over to the States. And a lot of them are starting to take hold uh, with builders who are looking forward. In addition to all these airtight products from Proclima, uh, we're also uh, supplying uh, some other interesting uh, complementary products. Gutex is a insulation that has can be used all over the building, as you see in this diagram. 
here, but the products that we're mostly interested in with Gutex are products that rigid insulation products for the exterior of the building uh, to replace foam uh, and as well as rigid mineral wool. So Gutex is a wood fiber, wood fiber board insulation made it's really the most ecological rigid insulation uh, that you could possibly make and uh, made in the Black Forest of Germany. That's the only drawback. One of these days we hope to start making it here in the United States where we have plenty of good fir and spruce which happens to be the best uh, trees to use with the lowest formaldehyde. So use, uh, in all respects, this is the, the healthiest type of insulation. It's mostly wood fiber, 96% wood fiber. It's vapor open, so your buildings can dry outward through it, not trapping moisture the way foam does. Uh, and it also actually doubles as a weather resistant barrier to the exterior products that we sell. Uh, so you don't need an additional uh, WRB uh, over this, if you choose to use this as your insulation uh, board. We also complete the enclosure with high performance daylighting from windows to what you see here, uh, roof daylighting, so unit skylights as well as uh, curtain roof uh, uh, products uh, that you see on the right. Uh, the PR60 is a very advanced triple pane skylight system that is actually Passive House certified. Uh, and we'll be talking about the importance of uh, certifying components in a little bit. Uh, we add also some products to the uh, heat recovery ventilation market here in the US. Uh, a unique product uh, from a company, uh, also a German company called Lunos. Uh, this is decentralized heat recovery ventilation. So heat recovery ventilation is a state of the art for how to ventilate your, your building, but we offer a decentralized option, which means no ductwork, which can often be very cost effective, very easy to install, very easy to maintain, and makes sense for a lot of projects, and very efficient. We also sell quality control software and testing apparatus. Uh, PHPP is the Passive House Planning Package, which every certified Passive House needs to have complete by a certified class of consultant. So, on to our presentation. Uh, there will be a lot of reference to <coughs> these products throughout the presentation, um, but that is, gives you a little bit of an overview of what we're about. And in addition to offering these products again, it's not just about, with, with these types of products, it's not about just throwing them out there into the marketplace. Uh, it's about educating people first because, again, they're so new in many respects. So here's some learning objectives for today's presentation. First, we're going to talk about what we mean by high-performance materials and their characteristics. Uh, then we'll uh, describe the principles of Passive House and what impact that has on, the, the, on a typical construction, how that changes things. Uh, we'll describe strategies for utilizing high-performance materials to achieve Passive House, these Passive House goals. And then finally, outline steps for how material utilization strategies can be optimized. Uh, and talk a little bit about affordability and comfort, durability, things like that that are really important as we build new buildings. So what makes a Passive House different? Well. What's really great about it is that it's a, it brings together all elements of a, of a building into, into a whole. Uh, it's an integrated methodology. And there really isn't anything quite as complete as a passive house. First of all, you're focusing on passive <coughs> elements. You're, you're, of course, taking care of orientation, very important, and massing to minimize surface area, insulation, air tightness, windows, doors, passive heat gains. We're optimizing the, the envelope. Uh, but also optimizing the heat flows. And then we have fixed performance goals. And there's actually only a, a few, which may, it's another beauty of the passive house is that uh, there's not a huge list of requirements. There's heating <coughs> demand, there's cooling demand, and you can see the numbers there, 4.75 kilo BTUs per square foot per year. That's about a 90% reduction from a typical code, building to code these days. 
And that's also where our name comes from, 475, in case you missed that. Uh, primary energy demand, which is not the site energy, but the source energy, uh, is going to be 38 kilo BTUs per square foot per year. Again, that's about a 75% reduction from a typical building nowadays. So these are pretty stringent requirements that require a pretty uh, exceptional effort uh, on the part of the design team. And of course, uh, the passive house also mandates uh, very, uh, very rigorous air tightness standard, uh, limit of 0.6 ACH50. And I just want to be clear here, I'm talking about the European, uh, the original European passive house standard here. There's also a newer FIAS standard, Passive House Institute US standard, uh, that has been devised, which is more uh, climate specific in its goals, but essentially very similar, and also similar in the huge dramatic reduction in energy and heat and cooling savings. Uh, so we put all these things together into uh, a into the PHPP, and we achieve a calculate this energy balance. Uh, and in the end, you really uh, should be able to heat a, a passive house, maybe a smaller one like a home with a couple of hair dryers. Is why we put that picture there. What's also nice about the passive house standard is that. It not only works in theory, but has been verified in the field. And this CPS project, uh, Central European Passive House Energy Utilization, or something like that, uh, that was performed back in 2000, looked at hundreds of buildings, uh, sorry, hundreds of dwelling units in, in a number of buildings. And they were able to show that the reality uh, was the same as the the predictions in the energy models, uh, that in fact, Passive House delivers dramatic energy savings, but also delivers very high levels of comfort, uh, certainly because of much less airflow, no air leakage, uncomfortable drafts, uh, but also heat recovery ventilation uh, that makes it super energy efficient and delivers all that, that ventilation air in a very healthy and very comfortable way. And so if you look at this, these graphs here, you can see the reductions uh, are way down here. These, these, these are the, uh, the numbers for the uh, uh, heating, heating demands uh, that, that are down by a factor of 90%. Another great benefit of passive houses is forced renewables transition. So it's a pathway to net zero energy building. So everybody wants to do net zero energy to solve the climate crisis. Uh, this is the best path forward uh, because we're uh, minimizing the, the heating, the overall energy demand, um, and it'll, uh, we think, move us faster to an all electric uh, future. And the, the latest rendition of the Passive House uh, Institute um, <coughs> standard out of Europe uh, is fully supportive of that with their primary energy renewable, that PER calculation, that, that, that is leading to 100% renewable grid. So what we've seen is a very bold implementation of Passive House worldwide. Brussels is leading the way. In 2015, they mandated all buildings, private, public, new, and retrofitted for passive house performance. Uh, Europe is coming soon, in 2020, shooting for nearly zero energy buildings, and passive house will be a big part of that. Uh, new York City and Vancouver have both set plans uh, in the next 10 years to start mandating passive house. So if you want to uh, have an epicenter or epicenters for passive house in this country. You'd start in New York uh, City and you'd also look to Vancouver. Those are the two areas where you might want to go if you want to get involved with passive house. And uh, interesting uh, that we can look back now on projects that have been built in Brussels and see that this is not a typical cost plus paradigm. As we add all these additional high performance materials and features, uh, we're not 
raising the cost of the building by a proportional amount. Actually, bringing the costs down, if you look at the red bars, the average of the passive house projects are less than the overall average. So that's very promising. And we're seeing uh, something similar uh, for multifamily housing, which has achieved, again, kind of a, a little, uh, well, multifamily building has a renaissance in, in Philadelphia, but specifically, a lot of these projects in Philly, because of certain uh, tax credits that are, that are available, uh, a lot of them are passive house. And hopefully this is a, a strategy that other states can start to adopt, but you can see the overall average is, is looking very good. So there really doesn't have to be a, a premium for passive house. But this is not, obviously there's gonna be higher cost for the materials, uh, but you're gonna, for some of the materials, but then you're gonna have savings passed on to, because your mechanical systems can get downsized. And so what we're seeing is not just what the passive house uh, name seems to suggest that these are houses, but we're seeing all sorts of buildings. Uh, it started out a lot of multifamilies, but now we're seeing all sorts of complex buildings from, a, uh, from office buildings in China on the upper left to a, a, the new embassy in Kinshasa, Congo. So all sorts of hot and humid climates as well, these work. On the lower right, you'll see a picture from the recently completed uh, residence hall at Cornell Tech in New York City the world's tallest passive house building, and we played a role in that. Uh, and there's a new hospital, which is always a challenge to get energy efficient. That's uh, being built now in Frankfurt, Germany, to the passive house community. Retrofits, of course. The next 50 years, most of our building will be retrofits. So here, a sampling of some projects. On the upper left, a retrofit of a townhouse in New York City. We do a lot of work with existing uh, brick buildings in, in uh, urban places, uh, a university building in, in Austria, a retrofit of a building in Westchester, uh, lots of different things here. And uh, there's a whole huge lineup of new projects uh, that are going to happen in New York City especially, but all over the country in the next five to ten years. So when we come to passive house, there's really five key principles. First, climate-specific insulation level. That's number one. Uh, number two, thermal bridge-free connection. So your insulation has to be as thermally broken as possible. Number three, extension of the envelope. Your high performance, your doors and windows have to be high performance as well. Typically triple paned and very airtight. Uh, Next, air tightness. The entire assembly has to be so airtight that you meet uh, very stringent blower door test requirements. And finally, you need to use high efficiency heat recovery ventilation. So when you put all these together and you utilize the uh, integrated software that the Passive House Institute provides, you can achieve a very low energy building using these optimized methods. And it's a win-win situation. Uh, one of the primary benefits is comfort and health. But affordability starts to become possible as, again, more of these buildings get made. Efficiency, of course. Predictability, if you have a very efficient building, and, and you're, you now know how much energy it's going to use, so you can size your systems appropriately, uh, which can save on costs and performance uh, for the life of the project. Security and resiliency are very important. Uh, in uh, this day and age, there's still chances of power outages. You want to be able to passively survive in your building for as long as possible in the middle of winter if there's an outage. Certainly, climate mitigation is also a benefit, uh, as well as the transition to renewables. And there's a universe of materials out there. So how do you choose? How do you know what's going to work? Uh, many of them will support Passive House. Many of them will not. But we want to lay out a few basic rules for what, what works and what doesn't. So you want three basic parameters. The first parameter, toxicity. Uh, and we're talking about really the, the, the life cycle of the product from manufacture to installation and use and onto disposal. Uh, we also need to ask, well, what is the performance 
how is that, that product going to perform uh, over its lifetime? And how is it going to withstand uh, events that uh, may, that, that challenge it? Uh, how tough is it? How robust is that product over its lifetime? How can we rely on it to continue to perform? Now, in terms of performance, one of the most important, again, central uh, aspects of Passive House is airtightness. And we like to bring up this concept of airtightness budget. So budget is something that you measure sort of uh, whether you're ahead or behind in your finances. But you can think of it in, in airtightness as well, whether we're ahead of the Passive House airtightness standard or behind it. And so this is a, just a theoretical chart, but what it's showing that uh, if you are putting OSB on a project, which some people still use as their sheathing, um, some OSBs are airtight, more airtight than others. And so some, if you look at this one, are precariously close to just kind of near, near that, that airtightness budget, whereas some are very far away from it. We need to choose the ones that are as far away as possible, right? That have that use the least of our airtightness budget in just that one aspect of the enclosure. And so, what we found in practice, or people have found in practice, some of our customers, in fact, is that when they're relying on OSB, and in some cases, you have you use you can use OSB as an airtight layer by taping the seams. Better if that's on the inside. Then on the outside, as we show in one of our uh, mock-ups over here, uh, in a so-called TGI outrigger enclosure. But it becomes very important if the OSB is, is uh, airtight or not airtight. And in fact, they've had to test to make sure, and in many cases, the OSB failed because it was not one of those that had the low uh, airtightness budget. Masonry as well can be very leaky. So here's a, here's a list of materials that per uh, the U.S. airtightness standard, ASTM E2178, are airtight. Well, uh, according to this, uh, it's kind of off. every single OSB out there should be absolutely uh, predictable in terms of how airtight. And that does not turn out to be the case. So we... Uh, we have, when we're talking about passive house, we have a very stringent airtightness budget that we have to be very focused on. And that, of course, means we have to be very focused on choosing the right materials. So now for our airtightness, we also need our airtight materials to be applied in a very effective way. They need to work in the worst possible conditions because we can't guarantee that the building site uh, in the middle of winter will shut down, but usually will not shut down uh, because it's too cold. It will keep on going, and that may be the day that we need to be taping the enclosure on the outside. Uh, there are certainly all sorts of options for air tightness and insulation, uh, like spray foam and butyl, but those have, very, have actually higher uh, temperature limits and a lot of uh, certain moisture requirements uh, and a lot of things have to go right in the process, uh, spray foam in, in particular. Uh, but what we like to say is better is to use these new generation of airtight tapes that have exceptional uh, ease of application and uh, work down to 15 degrees, uh, which is better than any of these uh, spray foams and, and butyl adhesives, and it are exceptionally moisture tolerant. You can actually apply... Uh, one of the tapes that we sell, because it's a particular type of acrylic adhesive, can be applied underwater. It just needs to be pressurized. So these are pressure-sensitive adhesives that are, again, just exceptionally, uh, exceptionally effective. Is it tough? So this is part of that robustness question. Is it meant to be a sacrificial layer? Some people use the, the drywall that you see pictured here as part of the airtight layer. Uh, we see it as more of a sacrificial layer uh, because it's going to take some abuse over time. And we want our airtight layer to be somehow uh, protected. 
on the left, again, airtight OSB, maybe uh, might be better, but again, you're running into the OSB problem. Uh, there's the other option in the middle. Uh, we offer a, pro a product called Intello Plus, which is an airtight smart vapor retarder, but it's a membrane. So you think, well, how can that be robust? Well, it can be robust. It can certainly, it's, 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 it has uh, a reinforcement layer, and, it's, and uh, it's, you want to protect it on the inside, though, to make sure that uh, it's, it is not penetrated uh, sometime in its life. And longevity, certainly, is one of the issues here. We want our airtight materials to, our especially airtight connections, to stay airtight for the life of the building. We don't want a building where the airtight layer fails first. We want the airtight layer to be the last to fail, because it's really the hardest to fix down the road. So a lot of, a lot of materials that we're familiar with really weren't designed with airtightness in mind. So we need to be really focusing on that, and what we're seeing now is a lot of these types of connections here, where we have a membrane coming down and hitting a solid substrate, and so we now we need a new generation material, which is a very flexible cock adhesive that is built to withstand, uh, that is built built to remain flexible long term, and tapes as well. Uh, we want tapes that don't delaminate, don't tear over time, don't compromise the airtight layer. A lot of tapes out there, but not all of them uh, have been uh, independently verified, like some of our tapes, uh, for a 100-year performance. Is it green? Another question we need to be asking. Again, in production, uh, lifetime usage, and disposal. And uh, here we see... Is the application of this product green? Um, I would argue, well, I'll leave, let you decide. Can your airtight layer multitask? Maybe you've never asked that question before. Well, we ask it all the time. And people, our customers, demand, uh, ask us all the time. Uh, is the airtight layer on the outside, the Solitex Mento 1000, also serves as a WRB, as a weather protective layer, so it's multitasking. The Intello Plus at the interior is an airtight layer and a smart vapor retarder. And it also is a netting, so it's actually doing triple duty. Uh, thermal control, there's certainly rigid installations out there that are, can be your airtight layer uh, and also providing thermal control. So, in the end, the only way we're really going to know for sure, if our products are going to perform well, is if there's some kind of verification behind them. Maybe somebody's had some experience and they've done a passive house. That's one way to depend on a product. But uh, there's also a reason why they have databases of certified components. And uh, that's what we're seeing now. There's uh, the Passive House Institute Europe certified Passive House database. Uh, everything from opaque building envelope products, to building services, to transparent building envelope products. That's how they divide it up. Um, and you can see some examples here of certificates. A couple of the products that we sell, like the Lamalux, Skylights, they have certified <coughs> components like the PR60 system. Here's a ventilation system from Adcon Air. There's many, many certified HVA, uh, HVAC systems uh, in, in Europe. Uh, and all of those could, you, could, could work here, too. Um, and there's a cert certificate for Intello Plus, which is, again, one of our uh, most popular products. So the design team in building a passive house needs to look very closely at what products get used where, uh, circle those areas. And those are the trouble spots uh, that need to be worked out, both in plan and section. And uh, then they should put together specialized drawings to show what needs to be done. And again, this is where often we come in. Uh, we've, we've put together a lot of free drawings for people to, to you, utilize free of charge uh, to get them started with their high performance details. And, and basically any of these details can be adapted for any PassPlus project. 
mostly wood frame, some historic masonry. Uh, we do have uh, a commercial uh, wall and roof uh, uh, drawing set coming soon. So that will be uh, even more useful to you, I hope. I like to show this slide here because it's not how we typically build our, our uh, single family or multifamily residential buildings these days. This is a uh, balloon frame building. It's how we used to do it. And there's actually some, some benefits to doing this because now we have the, the possibility of a nice continuous air and vapor control layer at the interior. Again, this is where we want to have it. Uh, ideally, and we can also do it continuous on the outside. So on both sides is where we really like to have it. But uh, you don't get that with a platform construction because you got to go around your floor joists all the time. So which means that when there are obstacles like that, it doesn't mean that you give up. You just change the way you do things. And one of the things that we're changing uh, or helping to change is some of the sequencing of construction. So for instance, if you have a framed wall and you have an interior, you have a framed exterior wall and you have a framed interior wall uh, that is butting up against it and you want to have a continuous airtight layer at the interior, well, first put up a one segment of airtight membrane and then you bypass that obstacle. And the same thing goes for your floor connections. So you're actually, in this case, you see here, putting a strip of material that will hang out for a little bit. Again, this is a flexible membrane. Typically, in this case, you don't want to use the airtight interior membrane, but you want to use something that is rated for exterior and protected from UV. And it's going to hang out here for a little bit until you frame the second floor and put on your next layer of, of Flooring, uh, not flooring, but subfloor, and then you flip it back up, and then eventually you'll be able to tape it to your interior airtight layer at the uh, both at both floors, and you've successfully avoided having to tape up into all of those uh, joist bays, which can be tough, especially if they're open web joists and that kind of thing. What was that membrane? So you're using here just an exterior. Membrane yeah, to, to do the bypass. No. No. Yeah. Which is which membrane? This one right here? Yeah. Well, um, should be Solitex, should be black, yeah. but somebody else used a different material in that case. Yeah. But there are any number of airtight materials that you could use there. Obviously, you want to have, if you're shooting, if your airtight, airtightness budget is here, uh, you want to make sure you. Uh, Use a good airtight material there as well. Have someone Photoshop Soltec on that. We should do that. <laughs> so, so this is basically just one large penetration here on the right that we're taking care of by going around it, by bypassing all those rim joist areas. Because taping that, you could be, if you were very detail oriented, you could you could be very successful in getting that airtight. But you'd also probably spend a lot more money than you want to. Uh, this is a very cost-effective and a pretty clever way to do it. Uh, when it comes to here, we're looking at the interior of a wall, and we're seeing these uh, cross pieces, these battens going horizontally, are a way to uh, hold back the intello when you're dense stacking behind it. But what's more important about it is that it's providing a buffer space to protect the airtight layer. Again, airtight layer is the most important part of our high performance building. So we need to make sure it lasts for a long time. Um, and you can put all your services in there. So there's not going to be, oh, hopefully we can limit the number of penetrations through that all important airtight layer. And there's wire and pipe penetrations to seal, a whole different slew of them that need to be addressed. Uh, and these need to be considered ahead of time. How are you going to do all of these? Because in a, in a very airtight enclosure, Again, you gotta, you gotta look at your budget. So there's interesting detail on the right here. This is uh, our best practice recommendation for how to do an interior airtight retrofit, at, including Passive House, 
uh, of uh, an existing uh, mass masonry building, like a brick townhouse. And what you do here is, what you're seeing here is this interior airtight membrane over a furred in wall, so you're adding insulation behind it, um, and you can do this safely without risking uh, moisture problems, freeze-thaw issues that people are often concerned about in these types of buildings, because the uh, the Intel Plus is not only a smart vapor, smart vapor retardant, it's also an airtight layer. You get them both in one. But to make it airtight, you actually want to cut back the floors and tape around all of the beam penetration. And it looks like a lot of work, but it's actually the only way in this kind of building to assure a uh, really airtight result. And you can see on the outside, there's going to be lots of opportunities in all sorts of buildings where you have clips holding up the exterior cladding. Uh, Looking up this 27-story building in, uh, in New York, quite a few of those connections. So to get these results, to keep the cost of a, pro of a passive house project optimized, uh, things really need to be planned in advance. And if you, if you add passive house components to uh, a regular pro project, and go about the project the normal way, you're probably just going to see mounting costs along the way, and you're not going to be anywhere near on par for cost. Uh, so there's a few steps that you really need to consider for Passive House for, to, to meet the objectives, to even meet the airtightness, let alone the cost objectives. First of all, there has to be a team meeting. Supervisors, foremen, everyone has to buy into this. Uh, and they take responsibility. And we found that this is common now. Tra trades are sometimes at each other's throats on projects, but airtightness is one thing that unites all trades, and they really often come together. Um, but you still need to identify a few key personnel to execute the air sealing and really take responsibility for it. It's always best to have someone on the team uh, that, is, that is trained. That's usually somebody on the construction team. There will, of course, be a certified pass-pass consultant on the project. Uh, hopefully, uh, the architect has some knowledge of it. But in the end, somebody on the, on the team, on the ground, needs to be trained. Sequencing is very important. We want to be able to uh, yeah, make sure the air barrier is complete before things go too far in the project, which is one reason to do the blower door test as early as possible in the process. Uh, and that often needs to be done. And that can be tricky in a large building where things are done sequentially often. And a smaller building is usually pretty straightforward. Just do it as early as possible. Sometimes people do it, on, do it with just one layer of house wrap on without the windows cut in yet. Just so they can see they have one element. And then they do maybe another one as soon as the, the windows are in before the insulation goes up. So, <laughs> in steps is, can be very helpful. Commissioning and testing critical components for the airtightness components, door and window components, ventilation, heating, cooling systems, all these uh, we need to be measuring to uh, see how well they're doing. Make sure it's running smooth. And like I said, airtightness is so important. We need to protect the airtight components. Uh, with the service cavity on the inside, that's unfortunately not a very common idea yet, but neither was a ventilated rain screen on the outside you know, 30 years ago. That's another idea that came from Europe and has taken firm hold here in the U.S. building industry. But a vented rain screen also helps to protect that, that airtight layer on the outside. So let's look at critical aspects, dive a little bit more into all of these uh, material elements uh, and in different categories while keeping in mind key themes from continuity, airtightness continuity, to integration of all these components, certainly lower toxicity. We want to, uh, it's not ex you know, explicitly part of the passive house standard to use low toxicity or healthy components. It is in our book, so we are very mindful of that in our product selection. <coughs> Inspection and testing, commissioning, training, as we just talked about, teamwork, those are all essential parts and key themes that we need to keep in mind. And certainly, we're going to be able to achieve 
the affordability of passive house by taking this optimized approach. So looking at air tightness, of course we need to measure it. We now know that air is something that can be measured, and we've been doing it for a while. Now it's starting to show up in all our codes. Um, and fortunately, we're, our codes are moving in, in the right direction. Uh, none of them are mandating passive house yet. We're not like Brussels quite, uh, but we're hopefully on the path. 3 ACH50 is a pretty big difference from 0.6 ACH50. Uh, and you know, if you were to uh, just juggle in PHPP, the passive house planning package software, and everything else kept the same in your building, and move the air tightness from 0.6 up to 3, you would maybe double or even triple the heat load of that building. So air tightness plays a really big, uh, big role in the, the efficiency of a building. It really is the driving force for performance. And why is it important? So we like to say second only to water control. Uh, it affects indoor air quality. It affects comfort. It affects wetting of the enclosure through because you're cutting off air transported uh, moisture. Uh, and you're also affecting heat loss because if your insulation is not airtight, your insulation simply can't perform to its potential. Uh, and uh, there's been a lot of studies on this, and this is maybe a study that you could do in your new laboratory here, actually blowing air through insulation materials to see how they stand up. I know it's been done on both continents, uh, and they've, they basically generally agree on, on the results. You might see an 80% reduction in performance because an insulation is not airtight. So by all means, let's make our insulation perform to its potential. There's already enough other factors limiting our insulation potential. So, so we like to say, again, inboard airtight is better. Uh, and why is that? Because uh, you're just not letting conditioned air from the interior get uh, through the envelope. And that air, which has moisture, is also not being able, that moisture is not being able to get to the cold exterior sheathing where it can condense and cause moisture problems and mold and all those other things that we're trying to avoid. Uh, what's also nice about the interior airtight layer is that it puts the components of your airtight building on the warm side of the enclosure. It keeps them dry. <coughs> they will benefit and be uh, from that because they will last a lot longer. Um, sorry, last but not least, um, the air control layer can and we, we feel should double as a vapor control layer. So now we get into the subject of vapor control, which comes a close third to water control and air tightness in terms of protecting a building from long-term damage. And I just want to reiterate that passive houses exponentially increase the dangers to, to building enclosures because by eliminating air leakage, as a pathway for drying in enclosures, uh, we are needing to now rely more on diffusion for drying, for the drying potential. But vapor control is really uh, looking at a lot of different areas because in the end, vapor can, because uh, there's going to be cold spots in our, on our exterior wall, uh, there's going to be air issues with windows and maybe not enough ventilation. Vapor control plays a role in all of these. It's really related to everything in our enclosure. Um, but when it comes down to it, the idea here, again, is to avoid condensation like we're seeing uh, there, the sweating. <clears throat> Just to drive home this point, poorly insulated walls, the one on the left where the infrared camera is showing all yellow, that's a pretty inefficient, uh, uncomfortable building uh, with a brick on the outside. But the brick is staying dry because there's all that uh, hot heat, heat moving outwards through it and keeping it out of trouble, too. But now when we make, this is the same building, sorry, and uh, same building that was now insulated on the outside. Now there's no more leakage. There's more, there's more insulation. So now this actually... Uh, is not going to be able to dry the same way. In fact, we have to be very careful about how we choose the materials. 
so they can dry effectively to the outside. So we need to look at this, you know, uh, how buildings dry uh, in, in our climate zone in, in, in wintertime. So we're in a mixed climate, climate zone five here. Uh, generally speaking, the vapor drive is outward in the cold season, right, in the heating season. Uh, and so we have a vapor retarder on the inside to try to keep that as much as possible out of the assembly, but we still want to encourage outward drying. In the summer, that vapor drive reverses. Now we want it to be as vapor, it's still going to be as vapor open as possible on the outside, but we want it to be as vapor open as possible on the inside so we're not trapping any moisture. A lot of really unhealthy buildings have resulted from moisture being trapped behind something like poly that doesn't open up on the inside. So this is, of course, an argument for smart vapor control in the interior. So you're never possibly ever uh, be able to trap moisture in there and keep your, your buildings as healthy and mold-free as possible at all times. Well, one of the real important aspects for the exterior is trying to make it as open as possible. So we want to have vapor open sheathing at the exterior. Uh, and uh, sometimes, you know, dense classes of one of products like that, exterior gyp board, those are good vapor open sheathings. You still generally want to protect them and, of course, protect them with a good vapor open uh, and very robust exterior membrane. And that's where these new membranes like the ones that we sell uh, are very important because, again, we, we do want to protect the building in a very robust way. And we're, we're saying, let's not do this. Most house wraps out there are of the microporous variety, and they're destined for failure. Um, these other types that are monolithic have a totally different microstructure and a more advanced way of moving moisture through them uh, to be able to allow moisture to diffuse outward uh, makes a huge difference, and especially, again, in a passive house where everything depends on diffusion, and you have oftentimes very cold surfaces on the outside that want to stay wet, and you want to encourage drying every step of the way. Of course, interior airtight membranes as well. Uh, there's a whole bunch of options, not all of them the same. I want to point that out. Uh, some perform better than others. Uh, but here, just looking into the building science a little bit of these uh, uh, exterior membranes. So the membrane that I'm talking about, this advanced exterior weather-resistant barrier, is actually a three-layer membrane with an interior TEEE plastic membrane that is, again, non-porous and monolithic. You can see the conventional technology, water can easily penetrate the structure when uh, something causes the water tension to be reduced. Uh, and that can include all these things right here, which are not uncommon and make contact with it. Uh, when you have the non-porous, always watertight and are not affected by all these same things. So we're avoiding common issues that can cause exterior membranes to cease to function to protect the building. High quality exterior membrane, again, is a three-layer material. So your top layer protects the outside. So you can actually use this layer uh, for a vapor open roof underlayment and walk over it because you're, it'll resist scuffing from, from the boots. Uh, you're used to probably ice and water shield, right? Which is a very durable membrane, but unfortunately, it's vapor closed. It's trapping moisture. You can't, you can't expect that anything will be able to dry out through it. And eventually, if there's a failure in there, it might take the whole roof with it. Uh, and that will be an expensive problem to fix. So uh, anyway, we have the interior membrane layer. This is the active layer that's providing the, the drying, the, the, the active the vapor open drying. And then you have the bottom layer, so it's protecting against any uh, unusual things of that uh, on the roof that you're, that you're laying it on, on the, on the uh, subroof. And so how does this look when you're in, in operation? At the top, they were actually showing uh, a microporous membrane, which actually looks a little leaky, but in fact, that's just condensation up there 
on the underside of the membrane. So we're just, this is just a, like a, a Tyvek type membrane uh, without any sheathing, just laid on top of a roof. Uh, and this is often how roofs are built in Europe, no sheathing at all, uh, just a vapor open membrane. But that, uh, that's why you really need something very waterproof like these more advanced Solotexes and so forth. But what's interesting uh, here is that, yeah, it looks like a leaky building, but in fact, it's just con condensing. You see, in fact, there, there's no moisture problems at all down here with the monolithic membrane uh, it's completely dry uh, because it remains vapor open at all times. <laughs> and getting back to the tapes, tapes are such a critical component of, of air tightness in this new generation of building. Uh, you've got acrylic options, you've got some butyl options. The acrylic options are unique in our product line because they are vapor open tapes. So again, we're talking about vapor openness on the outside and how important that is, especially in a passive house building, because you're never trapping moisture. Uh, there's a lot of tapes out there that are vapor closed. So there's going to be areas of your building that are trapping moisture. Uh, we're trying to uh, encourage the use of vapor open tapes uh, so that even around windows or taped connections of your membrane, uh, there's never any areas that uh, don't dry effectively. So, in terms of potential, uh, people are measuring all the time how effective these tapes are. Uh, we stand by the, the, the tests that, are, that were done in an independent laboratory in, in Europe that have shown 100-year uh, performance for the tapes that we sell. Uh, others have done backyard tests, sometimes pretty famously. Um, Results have been a little uneven, as you might expect, uh, but uh, with, with, with Coke bottles uh, providing, and also they're kind of peeling the tapes off in shear, which is not generally how the tapes are being pulled off in, in real life. But still, it, it's fun, and uh, people are, are, uh, have been doing that. Not recently, but as these high-performance tapes hit the market three or four years ago, um, at least in, in the U.S. market, uh, a lot of people got excited, like Peter Yost. He's a very well-known building scientist. So, anyway, uh, great that there's a lot of interest in these tapes. Um, now we want to make sure that uh, you know tapes uh, address penetrations and do it in a in a rigorous way. So, corners, corners of windows. You got to. We recommend going. And doing little detail folded corners uh, and, and taping all the edges using specialty tapes uh, with multiple release papers so you can really get those windows done nice and precise and with a very high quality. Uh, addressing penetrations, again, uh, here's another uh, way to, to tape a window. Actually gives you excellent quality control because you're doing it in a um, comfortable setting. Uh, on a in your dry interior, and then you're going to put that. This is a tape that has a backside adhesive strip uh, that first gets put on the outside of the window before the window gets put into the rough opening. And then all that you need to do after the windows in the rough opening is make that final connection to uh, to the on the interior to the, your interior smart vapor retarder like the Intello, or on the outside. Uh, you can use it for direct to your airtight WRB. Caulking sealants also uh, you know, need to, these are some of the ones that are available that are really designed, engineered from the get go to be specifically used for long term flexible adhesion uh, and often used uh, for adhesion. Of a, a permanent adhesion of a, a flexible membrane to a solid substrate. That's really where they are are used a lot. Gaskets. I mean, there are again a whole bunch of different components that can be considered. Uh, in the end, what's nice about using a gasket rather than taping around penetrations is that you're adding flexibility to it because the building is going to move. Right? Never forget that buildings move over time. 
Um, and uh, it's another problem with uh, an insulation or an air tightness like, like uh, spray foam insulation because it tends to be a pretty rigid. Once, it's, once it sets, spray foam is pretty rigid. And if you're counting on it to uh, be flexible and pen any penetration through it, uh, think again. It's, uh, it may not. Uh, insulations, uh, generally, again, we're trying to, in these, in these passive house buildings, we're trying to encourage drying as much as possible, outward drying. And so we want our insulations to be as much as possible vapor open. Uh, mineral wool is great. Unfortunately, there's still some formaldehyde issues, um, but there's some benefits too. I mean, no flame retardants, but overall pretty high embodied energy. Fiberglass, again, formaldehyde issues. So there's some health concerns and so forth with some of those more familiar insulations. Now cellulose, again, has the poor rates, but that's really a pretty mild uh, chemical, and it's really acceptable for use uh, for, to control fire pest and mold prevention. Uh, wood fiberboard is an, another uh, option that we're bringing to the market here. Again, this is probably the uh, even, even more ecological in terms of the source materials uh, and, and the manufacturing than cellulose. So very, very green. So now we need to look at this in Tello just a little bit more detail, these interior airtight smart vapor retarder. As you start to build walls and roofs that are getting to passive house levels, this really becomes much more important uh, as you're dealing with uh, riskier assemblies. Again, the, the, the more uh, airtight and the more insulated the building is, the higher the risks are for moisture damage. And this smart vapor retarder is the way to control that risk by having something that, uh, an interior vapor retarder that can vary and, op and open up in the summer uh, and make sure that the moisture levels in the wall always stay below 80% relative humidity. It's really key. And you can see this uh, Intello Plus was used in this Cornell Tech high rise. In this, it was done as part of a panelized system, so these components were all applied in the factory to very high levels of precision, uh, and then brought to the site and, and put up. And there were some interesting details as you run into it in commercial construction of this type. Uh, but uh, in the end, uh, the blower doored very well. Uh, and uh, they were able to, uh, to achieve uh, air tightness at the interior for the entire uh, building, probably the largest uh, building ever used with an interior airtight smart paper retarder. Well insulated is also a critical aspect of passive house construction. And I think I'm going to just go quickly through the last slides to make sure that we stay relatively on time. But continuous insulation that's thermal bridge free. Um, insulation levels, again, climate specific, like sleeping bags, right? We want to make sure we use the one that's rated for what we're doing. And here you can see, here's one way to wrap our building hopefully with a vapor open exterior insulation that can help with that outward drying. Uh, and what, what does continuous insulation give us? Well, it gives us high comfort criteria and safety from condensation. So we want to make sure that we're doing everything to minimize moisture uh, in there while also providing comfort. Uh, so those thermal bridges down there that, that are often in most buildings not even thought about um, are big problems for, for you know, there, there's a cold spot there that is going to be a moisture and a comfort problem. And you can see that's going to happen in, in foundation. And if we use certain insulation materials, we can get nice continuous uh, isothermals, isotherms, right? Uh, that uh, don't let any heat out. And same thing at parapet walls. There's always a more efficient solution uh, than maybe one you've seen already. Thermally broken connections at rain screens. Um, there's a lot of these around your buildings, your commercial buildings, 
uh, where you're using you know, uh, cladding panels of various types. There's going to be a lot of issues with uh, thermal, thermal breaks, um, thermal bridges, I'm sorry, the opposite of thermal breaks, at balconies. And uh, sometimes I, I drive around and I see balconies everywhere, and I'm, there's uh, very few of them have, uh, they're, they're basically like heat sinks for the building, right? And uh, there are products for that. Schuck is one, uh, another German company that provides solutions to uh, greatly reduce thermal bridges at components like this. High performance windows are. And a big part of the envelope. And passive house, you really can't get away with anything less than triple pane performance. Uh, and, and the fact is, is that comfort drives performance in these things. So here you can see, even on a cold winter day, the window is a comfortable place to be. And why is that? Because a high performance window uh, doesn't allow the, the temperature of that interior pane to get below a certain temperature. And as long as you're within about five degrees or four uh, Fahrenheit of that of the ambient temperature, you're not gonna feel the any any discomfort from the radiant cooling of that window. So that's really something to always keep in mind. So it really does matter um, what the uh, the, the glazing of the windows uh, for comfort. Uh, what also matters in windows is the spacing, uh, the spacers, and the frames uh, can vary a lot. The, that, can, that can make the interior temperature change a lot too. And of course, there's always a condensation, which is a health and a durability issue that we need to consider at the interior of those windows. Window placement matters. You can see a little hard to see on the slide, perhaps, but on the this is actually now putting the window on the outside. This is on the very inside. This is in the middle. Which is the most efficient? The U value can tell you. The lowest U value can be found when it's in the middle. When it's on the uh, when the when it's on the outside. I'm sorry. So this is on the inside. It's so asymmetrical. Uh, it's, and it's not aligned with the insulation either. On the outside, it's a little bit asymmetrical. When it's on the inside, it's perfectly, this isotherm is very symmetric, and therm, therm doesn't lie. It tells you exactly uh, that you get a benefit by putting that window in the metal. Skylight integration, uh, absolutely. We can actually now, didn't used to be the case, but now we actually have high-performance skylights available, like the ones that we supply, that don't compromise performance at the skylight. There's really no other skylights that you can depend on, um, especially in a higher humidity environment, like around a, a kitchen or a bathroom. Um, but in any case, if you have a cold spot in a, in, in a thermal bridge in areas like around here, uh, you're destined to having condensation issues. That's why most skylights on the market here in the U.S. have drainage on the interior because they know there's going to be moisture coming off that window. Um, that's not necessary, and you won't see it as a feature on any of these Lamalux skylights. So last, and certainly not least, fresh air ventilation. Um, we need to be supplying ventilation to every room, every space, uh, and exhausting from certain spaces, bathrooms and kitchens. Uh, and this gives us control. Once we have an airtight building, we have to ventilate. It is required in the state of Massachusetts for residential construction as of the 2012 ICC code adoption. I don't know what the case is for commercial, but maybe you can enlighten me. Yeah, oh. yeah so it's similar. But now, we at least we, we got to the point in our code where we recognize that we need to be making our buildings tighter, but at the same time, we need to be providing mechanical ventilation. They don't yet tell us that it needs to be uh, uh, heat recovery ventilation, uh, but we do know that heat recovery ventilation is the gold standard. 
This is how we should be doing it. And there's all sorts of choices out there, from centralized units to semi-centralized units to semi-decentralized and all the way down to decentralized. And uh, you can use these for all different purposes as needed. And again, we're, we're serving the, the sort of more smaller end of things, where you have fans that are working together between the different rooms in the uh, in, in an apartment or a house, uh, but there is a, ventila a separate ventilation unit in each room. Uh, and just to give you an idea here, I don't want to get into this style anymore, but I think we included it just to show where there, there's a big multifamily market out there that is dealing with trying to uh, certainly achieve higher performance standards and also trying to figure out the best ways to ventilate. And uh, HRVs versus ERVs, which means heat recovery ventilation versus energy recovery ventilation, uh, is, is starting to become an important question. So we'll leave that question unanswered for today. Anyway, lower toxicity. We want to make sure that the, the, all these materials for passive that we use, whether or not it's mandated by passive house standard or any other, there's certainly plenty of standards mandating out there, um, uh, like, like LEED and so forth, and Living Building Futures Institute, uh, lower toxicity. We want to limit occupational health hazards, occupant health pa hazards, and biosphere health hazards. And we've worked very hard to lower toxicity and by, by bringing in materials that uh, meet very high standards, including the declare label of the um, Living Building Futures Institute. Um, and in the end, what it takes to build Passive House, in addition to all these components, right? We've already talked about it a little bit. Trained professionals, integrated design, on-site verification. Now we talk about occupant orientation. Occupants need to know what they're living in, too. So there needs to be some training on that end. Uh, Third party verify. That's something that's new uh, for passive houses for verifying them. Air tightness testing plan and so forth. So, and what we like to we like to help out people on building sites by providing signage. Um, this is on the the back of one of our product cards that people can copy and hang up all over their their project so that. Nobody uh, will have any excuse, especially the subs that come in that might have missed the, uh, the team meeting, uh, and uh, put holes in that all-important airtight layer, especially the one on the inside. And certainly there's other uh, testing verification uh, around the industry. So here's a bit of summary of what we uh, talked about today. Uh, maybe I'll just leave this one up. Uh, but we are here as a material resource, obviously a component resource, but also a knowledge resource. Hopefully today was gave you a little bit of a flavor of the kind of knowledge that we can provide uh, for any type of project. It doesn't have to be Passive House. I would say 95% of our projects are non-passive house. The passive house movement is growing slowly, and we're trying to help it along. And one of the things that's going to help the passive house movement to grow in this country is not only more practitioners like you, but more products becoming uh, available here and certified here. So we're part of that. Very nice.